Um, there was nothing available to, for backyard people to go find out anything about jujubees. I uh, found a lot of this information up in um, agriculture, um, UC Davis libraries. And you and I just can't really get into that. So I just uh, approached the, uh, CR, the CRG and said, let's do a, a book. We'll sell it at cost, essentially. And uh, I don't know how many we've sold, maybe 2,000 so far. So it's available 275 pages or so of just information, not many pictures. <laughs> I figured you can look at the tree and get all the pictures you want. Uh, jujubes, known as uh, Xysophus jujuba for most people. Actually, its scientific name has been changed. It is now Xysophus Xysophus. Uh, normally, that's not allowed, but it's Z-I-Z-I -Z -I for the first word and Z-I-Z-Y -Z for the second. <laughs> so that made it legal. So, but not too many people know it as Zeisimus Zeisimus. Uh It is grown from about Morocco, both sides of the Mediterranean Sea, over through the uh, Arab states. In uh, most of the Arab countries, call it Anab or Onab. Through India, where it's bear and boar, in 500 different other names that I don't know. Those are the two names I know. Uh, through uh, Cambodia, Patria. Uh, I have a local post office in Fountain Valley, and every time I go into the post office, one of the fellows is Cambodian, and that's why I say, Patria, Patria! <laughs> Nobody else knows what he's talking about but me, but uh, uh, Vietnam is Tao Tao, Chinese Sao, <laughs> and yeah, Hong Sao, but that means the red one, yeah. the, the dried red, really. And then uh, up to uh, Korea, where they sneeze it and they say they chew. <laughs> so, it's got a lot of different names. Uh, in China, there's probably about 900 plus different varieties. Every district wants to have its famous jujube. So far, I've been able to collect 40 plus of them. Uh, they're tough to get out of uh, China. Uh, I can sneak them out but they don't want to give phytosanitary certificates on them anymore. They just don't want the material to go out, so I can't get them anymore. I've still got some left in Australia to get out, and I can get phytos out of there. Um, I brought plenty of fruit for you to try. Uh, normally we start harvest uh, 15th of August with the lead, and then the different varieties come on at different times, which makes it nice. At first, we only did lead, and we would go about a month and then our season was over with. Then we got this one called Sherwood from Louisiana. And that one, as soon as the leaf finishes, the Sherwood takes off. That gives us another four to six weeks of fresh fruit. So most of the fruit you get to try tonight is fresh. Uh, the Lang, which has been known in the United States for over 100 years, is the pear-shaped one. Uh, but it's not as nice when you eat it fresh. Uh, it just doesn't have the, the flavor that the others do. But if you let it dry on the tree, it's wonderful. It's about 75% sugar. So that's getting into the date area. And that's why they call them Chinese dates. So it's just a wonderful tasting fruit. What I do in November, uh, we take the dried fruit, take the seed out, mince it up, and put it in turkey stuffing. And stuff the bird. And they're really good. It makes wonderful turkey stuffing. Okay, so we've seen the book. Um, I'm going to wait on a while for the uh, pictures. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's pass this around. This is just my uh, different varieties that I've collected on one side, and then how to grow them on the other side. So I'll give you some information. So we'll pass them around. I don't know if we'll get everybody. If you don't get one, email me. I've got cards here and I'll send you the information that way. I live in Fountain Valley, Orange County, so we come down here twice a week. Come down here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. When I retired, I figured I'd better keep my system going and be here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday, or I'll start to slough off. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that. And you start to slough off, you lose the farm very easily. So that's what I'll pay for it. It's all winter. <laughs>
Um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, two years ago I went to, uh, got invited by a G2B grower in Israel to go see his place. He hosted this for 10 days, I think it was. And he's got, oh, about an acre under cloth. And he put it under cloth so that he has Mediterranean fruit fly in that area. But he doesn't get it inside his tent, so he doesn't get inspected by the uh, government agencies. And so he can market his crop. He takes it, whatever he picked that day, packages it, takes it down to the harbor at Tel Aviv, and they take it by ship to the mostly Eastern European countries. Uh, most of the place, people don't know it, but they buy it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my customers are Vietnamese people. Dao Dao. And our phone, cell phone rings off the hook from oh June on. Is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Well, you know it's not ready to July or August. Uh, oh no, I was checking anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna hate to see our our cell bills this year or this month because people call four or five four or five times for one delivery on Sunday, one delivery on Wednesday. So I guess kind of heavy. Okay. Um, now these are what the dried looks like. This is the lang. It's the pear-shaped one. Um, it's not very good fresh, but it's wonderful dried. You get to taste it. One of the problems that jujubes have, um, birds love to go after them. And they only like to peck it once or twice, and now well, they're better ones. They go to the next tree, the next tree, the next tree. Uh, and so we were losing about 35% of our crop to birds. There's no other pests that I know of really on the tree, just the darn birds. Uh, when we went to Japan one time, on the rice fields, I saw mylar tape. There it was silver and gold, silver on one side, gold on the other, that they would put on the field, and that scared the birds away. So I got a supplier here in the United States that carries it. Mine's red and silver. We put that up around the tree. So it looks like a used car lot, <laughs> but it works just fine. We got our losses down to 3% or less now <laughs> on, on uh, the ginger bee fruit. Oh, uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Uh, anybody have questions, just keep your hand up and, and I'll stop and we can go on to answer that. Okay. If I'm near the fruit, I can remember more things. Well, you can see it from here. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, um, while we were in Israel, everybody here probably knows about what's called we call the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus was. They don't call it the Sea of Galilee. They have a name that incorporates the word Jujube in it. And so they call it Jujubee Lake, essentially. And I thought that was surprising that that's what they would call it. Completely different from what we call it. There are only a couple of growers there. One grows it outside, and he has to have his crop inspected because of the fruit fly and put out uh, bait and things like that for him. But here, uh, as far as I know, there are no pests, really. Um, gophers love to eat the roots. There's a lot of gophers around here. Uh, we're just off of Gopher Canyon, which should have been a first clue. Uh, so we put, we go get chicken wire, um, you know, make it three foot around or so, get three foot high, hold the bottom underneath, put it in the ground, plant the tree in that. Uh, it's not 100%, but it works darn good because it takes 20 years for that to disintegrate completely. So we've stopped the, the uh, gophers giving us problems anymore. Uh, we had deer at one time. Um, talked to some guys at uh, the local um, uh, pipe place. Oh yeah, we're hunters. Oh, I kind of know where you, there are some deer. Uh, they're kind of bothersome. And it took six months or nine months, but we got rid of them. Didn't have any problems anymore. Uh, why don't we turn on the slides and we'll go through that a little bit. <coughs> to grow them out and you want to keep them pruned, that's fine. You can keep them to 8, 10 foot if you want. And you just prune them at a given point just above uh, the next branch. If you want that to be, you want to stop right there. You don't want that branch to grow any higher. Don't need more pruning. If you want to let 
the, the new shoots come out, there's a shoot, an eye under every branch. If you want those to come out and then go up another three foot, cut the next two branches off. Just don't cut so close to the tree that the uh, eye is cut. And that will send out nice new shoots next year. And you just keep doing that every year. This is a crop that hates cold on sleeves. So it's found a trick. He says, if I don't bloom, bloom until late March, early April, and then once my fruit is done, come September, October, if I get rid of all my leaves right away, I don't have to worry about cold. Well, here in Southern California, they don't have to worry about cold at all. They go down to about 30 to 40 below zero. So they're a Midwest uh, plant, and, and you find in Kansas and Iowa, Kentucky, uh, very northern, they might have a problem. Can we dim the lights at all? Roger? Yes. Do they fruit on first or second year wood? Um, they will do on first year, and then they just keep on going. Okay, now there's jujubes. And some of them, as you can see, I cut in half. Those are the seeds. That's another reason they got the name Chinese dates. Because the seed looks like a date seed. Uh, unfortunately, on Lee and Lang, uh, they, those came out of China by Frank Meyer back around 1900. He went to China and explored all over and brought back persimmons and all sorts of plants out of uh, China. Uh, but the seeds there are sterile. If you really want to get new jujube plants, you got to get from the rootstocks that come up. Or you get it from the small fruit that comes from rootstocks. Those usually have seeds that are viable. Okay, next. What was that? What was that kind? That was a Lee. That was a Lee. L I. Now I call it Lee. It might be Li. I don't know much Chinese. Roger. Yes, is correct. Is it true that the land grows faster than Lee? Because when I was trying to buy one of the other nursery told me that. That they one the will land, grow faster? Yeah. That they no. need to pick land because it's faster growing. No, they're, they're the same true. same speed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is typical tree in, in my place in town, in uh, Valley Center. You can see the bird tape up there that says use car a lot. Um, and it does keep the, the little sparrows away. Uh, we've got a lot of crows too. Number one, crows don't seem to care for jujubes, uh, and so it's not a problem. So if it's a more aggressive bird, crows, um, blue jays, that type of thing, they could care less about a little bit of flash. But they don't seem to tend to be a problem on jujubes anyway. And you can see there's 25 pounds of fruit there on that tree. Mm -hmm. Next. Roger, what yes. about squirrels? I don't have any problem. You're talking about ground squirrels. Right. Uh, I've got them. And they found my horned melons. And they eat my horned melons up like that. But they don't bother with jujubes at all. Mm -hmm. Never seen one on a climbing a tree. How about rats? Uh, there are rats there, but I've never seen them bother them. Um, we had a dog one time that during picking season, he loved to go out and pick his own. <laughs> and he knew how to pick the whole, to take the whole branch with fruit on it, start at the top, and just pull the fruit off without getting stuck by the thorns. Amazing. There's two major problems with jujubes. Most of them have thorns. On the Lee, generally they're hooked. They're half inch oak thorns. Oh. Uh, yeah, they can get you, but if you're careful, you can miss those. But then there's some varieties that have one hook and one dagger. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes it harder to, to get in both ways and, and get away from them. If they also send out runners. 50 foot from the tree, you'll suddenly see a new uh, cutting come up. And you don't know what in the world you're going to do with them. Uh, number one, you can just mow them down or hoe them down. It takes a hoe five minutes per tree. I mean, if you got 1,500 trees like I do, that goes into time. But I let them grow because I can. I learned how to dig them up in the wintertime when they're dormant. That's my root stock for next year's growth. Mm -hmm. So I go out digging, and I started selling those now. Make a nice profit on selling the, the plants that way, too. So there's my field. You can see them up in the hillsides where most of the avocados are. A lot of the avocado grows have left, and now we have horses. 
But the horses don't bother either, so that's okay. Okay, next. You can see an awful lot of weeds that I should have gotten, but you know, those are endless. Okay, next. Okay, there's Shirley. Uh, that's in springtime when they're just starting out. And they'll probably March, mid March or so, when all chance of frost is gone. And they start coming out. Uh, you can see some of the fruiting canes up there. Fruiting canes, one year. They'll have their fruit and they're no good the rest of the life. They, all they'll do is, they come Santa Ana wind time, they'll drop off. No problem. Oh, man. Next. Uh, that's fall time. You can see they're starting to turn yellow. It's one of the few tree crops we have in Southern California that will turn colors. So my field turns all nice and yellow for about two weeks before all the leaves disappear. Next. Question. question. Yes. Do you trim, is it better to trim on the top or no, like, uh, the, like this one? There is yeah. a branch It would be better to trim them. Um, when I first got into it, I had nobody to ask. I had nobody to ask about anything. Uh, now, going to Israel, I learned a lot of how they prune them. And that's part of the place between that and going to Australia and meeting a fellow, a Chinese fellow there that knows how to prune jujubes, of pruning them by cutting them and then cutting the next two branches. And then they send out nice new growth. Have, have you dwarfed any varieties? There are no dwarf varieties. You can keep them fairly small if you want. If you really want, you can keep them to six foot. Uh, that's what my friend uh, in Israel did in the open field. He's got his at uh, about seven to eight foot because he prunes heavily every winter time. And, Next. He, and he still gets enough canes. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Good production. You force it to come out the side like this and come up. Yeah. How do you harvest the ones up high? Uh, number one anymore. I get a worker. <laughs> uh, we just get ladders, and he's a monkey on a tree. <laughs> so you either let that fruit go, or you prune the tree. If it's a problem, you work around it. Next. And winter time. This is about what they look like now. Not quite, but gives you an idea of uh, what you're facing. You know, a lot of leaf litter. Uh, Little, little plants coming out of the ground down here. These are my winter dig outs, and that's what I use for uh, uh, crafting plants next year. Next. Okay, springtime. Amazing how the seasons are just changing so fast. <laughs> These are all fruiting canes right down here. This is a side, what I call a side lateral. That will stay there. It won't grow very much in length. It stays the same length, uh, but it, it, it sends out the fruiting canes every year. So we get new fruit. Okay, next. And there's some growth. And this isn't a real good representation, but we've got, we'll see some other pictures. This is the pine cone. And they will look like pine cones, and they uh, grow about one millimeter a year. They hardly grow at all. But they stay there, and they send out new canes that are fruiting canes every year. I don't know. Yeah, there's a little tiny flower there. The flowers are not impressive. You're not going to pick a bouquet of these. Next. Okay, there's the pine cone. You can see it there. Ants love the trees. Uh, but I think all they do is pollinate for us. Uh, it used to be said that you needed two varieties, especially Lee and Lang, to have fruit. Uh, I've proven, at least in the case of Lee, I had one single tree in Long Beach. We had fruit every year, and that was the only tree around. So I know that you don't need a second tree to have fruit. Next. Yeah, I even got it right. Oh, that's Lee. Um, now, you, different varieties, you can pick at different times. Some of them need to be completely red, or they're not very sweet. Other ones can have some yellow still on them. And others still, as long as it's got a little bit of red, that's all you need. 
And I found out that if I pick them mostly yellow, just with a little bit of red, uh, they last longer on the shelf. They don't last very long. Um, two or three days is all I can get in the market. Mm. Uh, but what was that interesting, when I started selling them 25, 30 years ago, uh, nobody knew about them at all. And uh, I talked to the store manager, I'd like to put these in for you. Uh, well, how much do you want for them? Oh, how about $1.99 and you sell them for $2.99? And a dollar profit is darn good for produce then, per pound. And so I said, sure, I'll do it. And I told him, well, okay, and anything you have left, I'll replace, I'll take back. If I brought in 100, 150 pounds, I might get five pounds back. It all sell. And it got to the point where when I would go in there on a certain day, the shoppers knew it when I would be there. And they were circling around <laughs> with the shopping carts waiting for me to come at 10 o'clock the next morning. Okay, next. In the fruit. Oh, they taste like little dry sweet apples when they're fresh. They taste like dates when they're dry. Very much like these. They completely change their taste and texture. Next. Uh, there's my older worker. Uh, he has quit now. But you can see the, the color of the fruit. You know, up here it's got a little bit of red, a little bit of red, but mostly yellow. And that's what the market's like now. At first they wanted only red ones. And it took a little bit of education, but I got them convinced that they want mostly yellow now. Okay, next. That one's not quite ready as far as lead. Uh, it has about a 20% sugar at that stage. It's edible, but it's not the best in the world. You want a little more color on that. Let me see if I've got any in here. Oh yeah, the sure looks down here. Uh, yeah. Kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking for in color. And of course this side paints the sun. This was mostly red. But they don't need to be real heavy red color. Apparently there are some Vietnamese that like them with just about that amount of color. Yeah. So uh, sometimes if you have the right clientele, you can sell them just about any time, mm -hmm. any color. It is a problem, or it used to be a problem. Uh, oh no, that's the wrong color. I want fully dark. <clears throat> and then I'd bring them fully dark next time, and they'd always say, oh no, I want mostly yellow. <laughs> okay, whatever. They're right. Next. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are, uh, those are the little rootstock fruit. And that's used mostly for medicines. They are sour or tart, uh, but they use jujubes for a lot of different medicines. I used to work with a lady from Afghanistan. She called it Onab. Uh, she hated jujubes. Why do you hate them? I think they're nice. Oh, because when I was young, my mother forced me to, to drink the, the juice for uh, sore throats and upset stomachs. So she wouldn't touch them anymore. But they were nice. OK, next. Well, there's a uh, Lee that is mostly a couple of weeks away. But there are a few. And we actually go through and we pick twice a week. We make sure they have some color uh, before we pick it. So we get our hand in there and just take it off. This one should have a little more color for Lee. So that's three days away. Next. Yeah. After how many years the tree starts uh, fruiting? I have two jujubes and three years old, or at least I planted them uh -huh. three years ago. They're not producing. Okay, uh, when I graft jujube plants, a month later after grafting, they can have fruit on them. Wow. So what is probably happening, jujubes withstand drought very well. If we have a, another water cut off, and you can only water once a week or something, the trees will survive. But the first thing they'll do is drop their fruit. So you won't get any fruit at all. So don't worry about it, just water them. Once um, springtime time comes, uh, just water them good. 
mulch them. Uh, a little bit of fertilizer, but they don't care too much. Uh, sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. Uh, sometimes I get horse manure and put a whole wheelbarrow horse manure around them. That helps. Yeah. Yeah, I, I brought a chicken meat too, but uh, they are so very small one and turn to red. Uh, quite, yeah. They turn red? Yeah. Okay. Very small. You yeah, chicken. yeah. Uh, that's because it didn't get enough water in the springtime. Oh, okay. And what it'll do, it'll bloom. Usually when they bloom in March, the land still has plenty of water in it. But come April, when it's getting ready to s set the fruit on, it doesn't have enough water. And the first thing it does, it, it ripens the fruit immediately at a quarter of an inch yeah. and it drops it. So water it more. Make basins around the tree, mulch it, and make sure it gets plenty of water during the growing oh, season. Okay. Anytime it gets warm. Mm -hmm. uh, normally we don't have a problem here as long as you get water to it, except when they're ripening. Then we get the, a lot of times we get the Santa Ana winds. And uh, the, the first thing the tree does in the Santa Ana condition is steal all the water it can from the fruit so the tree survives. It turns the fruit all mushy and it's no good to eat and it will not rehydrate. So that crop is lost. But if it's still green on the tree, those tend to stay on okay. And you just hope the Santa Ana winds quit in a couple of days to, to get going again. Uh, I, I think that's Silver Hill, but I'm not sure, but we'll go to the next one. This is Sherwood. I first discovered that uh, there's another group like ours called North American Fruit Explorers, NAFEX. And one of the guys who was writing articles was a fellow named Sherwood Akins. And he said, I've got the biggest huge bees you've ever seen. They're the size of lemons. <laughs> they're, they're that big. Yeah. The worst lemon crop I've ever I would have ever seen. <laughs> but I love his fruit. He said it came out of an old Louisiana plantation. It was probably smuggled 50, 75 years ago. So it's in the United States. But it gives a wonderful crop, very dense. It gives a thicker skinned fruit, so it protects the water in the fruit better. So that's what I'm saying. Those are perfect for picking now. If you let them get fully red, uh, you're, you're taking a chance with the birds getting them. But uh, those are still 25, 30% sugar at that point. Next. Again, the little babies. They, they can have hundreds and hundreds of fruit. Next. Well, those aren't quite right. They're getting darn close. Here's one that just dried up. I have no idea why. No big deal. Next. Uh, that was one, uh, a plant that I discovered, came out of the Chico Research Station uh, back in the 1950s. They, uh, they would bring in plants from around the world. And they had to sit there for a couple of years before they'd let them out to the farmers. And they uh, collected about 10,000 seeds of their old jujube trees and planted them. And they did get some winners out of this plantation. And one is GA-866. Has nothing to do with Georgia. It was section G, <laughs> subplot A, the 866 plant down the road. The very sweetest, 45% sugar when it's fully ripe, but not dry. Yeah, tell them what happened to Cal Chico Kiwi. Oh, okay, that's kiwi fruit. There's a company named Cal Chico. When kiwi fruit started, um, late 60s, early 70s, they had come on and they were a, a grafting company and selling the plants. The main problem they had was their worker a Mexican fellow who was an excellent grafter, but to him, Sunday night meant borracho night, getting drunk. And he would get himself plastered to the wall. Monday morning, he wasn't in much better shape, and he was grabbing whatever wood he had, and he was grabbing the male kiwi fruit wood and grafting eight males to call them females. And he took the female wood and grafted one and called that the male. 
So he had eight males for every one female that they were selling the next year. Uh, it took that company about three years before they went bankrupt because of that. <laughs> That's Cal Chico. And they oversold because they didn't have the quantity. It's right, the and they had plenty of plants. People but, were driving yeah. trucks up there and picking up any trees they, they, they got their yeah, hands on. Yeah. Sometimes they were all male. Yeah, they were. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, there's one of our visitors. Uh, the birds got to it first, put a little hole in it. Uh, then the bees and the wasps can come. Uh, they are a problem if you're reaching around and you don't see where they open it up on the other side. And I've been stung several times. Uh, the wasps come kind of chase you a little bit. And the worst thing I ever did was like this and it went right down my shirt. <laughs> it got me right under here. Uh, so that's a minor problem. It's not minor the moment they sting you, but you know. <laughs> okay, next. Well, you can see where the birds have got it up there. A couple of them. Once I put that bird tape up, I don't have that problem anymore at all. We used to lose a third of our crop. Not anymore. Next. Okay, this is the, what the dried fruit looks like. Uh, really, this was fruit that was bird pecked. You can see where the birds got it. But it doesn't hurt the fruit at all. And you can wait until it uh, dries up somewhat. The skin kind of covers up where it was broken. And you can pick it and sell that. We didn't start selling the dried fruit until a couple of years ago. Farmers markets now are wonderful for me. That's where I sell it. Okay, next. Okay, this is a different shape. There are all sorts of different shapes on jujube. Some are perfectly round. Some are pear shaped like Lang. Uh, this one is Anted Meyer. At least that's the translation I got from China when they sent that plant over to me. It's very sweet, very nice, but a smaller fruit. And you can see there are some of them that are ready to go and a few of them that are not quite ready to pick. Next. This is Lang. This is our dried fruit one. Uh, and it's just programmed to start to split once it gets near ripening time. And so it can split around the fruit or it can give a straight line down the fruit. That's just nature's way of starting the drying process. Um, a lot of people don't like it that way, but it's fine. Uh, it, it's really good dry. Next. Well, this could be uh, Silver Hill. I'm not sure. I've got Silver Hill over here. It's a really nice fruit in one manner. It's the very last one to ripen on the tree. So come from now until uh, first or second week in November, I still have fresh fruit available. But that's what people want. The downside is it doesn't taste very good. It doesn't have good sweetness. But if you're really desperate for the last crop of, of jujubes that are fresh, there it is. And we'll get to try it uh, and see if you don't like it like I don't like it. <laughs> Next. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd say it's probably Anton Meyer. Uh, another picture of it. They're nice and sweet. Next. And there's our crop. And most of this now, we used to take them to 99 Ranch Market. Because I was the only person that had them. And we'd take them twice a week. And we'd sell out every few days. And we'd put them in boxes or we'd get banana boxes. That's what I really like, the banana boxes. Because they're well built. They'll hold 40 pounds of fruit. No problem at all. But anyway, that's what we're looking like. We want a little bit of red in it, uh, but mostly blonde fruit. Next. A little closer. You can see where it's split. Up here on this one, and that one up there splitting a little bit. No big deal. Hey, Roger? Yeah. In general, how does the flavor change when it goes from yellow to like a fully it red? It's just sweeter and a little more intense flavor. As I said, it tastes like apples. If I were to give you 
a cutting and let you try it, you'd think you were eating apples. Okay, next. Is that the end? Must be. Shirley, did you steal that? Well, it must go into the kiwi next. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's keep it. Don't worry. There's a picture of Shirley picking fruit. Oh, yeah, I stole that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I read someplace that um, the way to get red ginseng is to roast ginseng over these jujubes. Is it any kind of jujube or just the red? red I've never heard of that, so I don't know. Can't answer you. Just something yeah. red. Yeah, in, in China, yeah. Take like a medicine. We usually use the jujube spoon with the chicken. And the winter time or uh, the babies after birth, uh, they have to eat that kind of soup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they make soup out of jujube fruit. Is there decide how much you pick fresh and how much you let dry? Uh, I want to pick all the fresh that I can. That's my market. Number one, they weigh twice as much as the dry food. It's only twice as much money. Uh, most of my customers want it fresh. They don't want it dry. Uh, but now I'm starting to get people that want it dry too. So that, that's the deciding factor. I take all my orders. Uh, as I said, the phone rings off the hook because people are calling in orders. And they're calling two hours later to say, oh, no, I need 10 more pounds. OK. <laughs> and uh, they call two hours later again. Oh, are you going to be there Tuesday? No, I'm going to be there Wednesday. Oh, yeah, come Wednesday. It, it's a, talking on the telephone constantly. Yeah. Up in the tree, on the ladder, talking. <laughs> yeah. The last photo, the box showed a lot of yellow fruit with a few red ones. Uh-huh. Are those yellow fruit going to continue to ripen and turn? They will. They're like a banana. You get green bananas. And then as they ripen, they turn yellow. Then they get little spots. Jujubes get the same little spots. And they grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and they all grow together, and then they turn red. They won't ripen once they're there. Is it a sensitive fruit? Is it a bruising or anything? Or when you the fruit itself? Yeah. Well, I handle it pretty carefully. So, um, you know, it doesn't go through commerce like apples and pears do. They get bounced around. So I don't have to worry about that problem. I just put them in a 40 pound box, and they seem to work just fine that way. I read online that uh, a mature tree, uh, an established tree, can actually stand quite a bit of water on its roots. Uh, yeah, when it's growing, it cannot take very much water when it's winter time and all the leaves are gone and it's not transpiring anymore. So you want to keep water away from it when it's not in the growing season. And I have lost some trees because they got too wet. A spring would come up underneath it, especially my neighbor up above me. His water would come down the hill, and then it'd come up in places and kill the plants. You lose a few here or there. Do you ever have to thin the fruit? Like no, no. It's just amazing. Whatever's there mostly grows to full size. Um, and again, animals don't tend to bother it at all. So it's just, you got to make sure you're there from August 15th through October through Halloween to be able to pick your fruit and take it to market. I noticed that it flowers from this from the end of the branch up towards the trunk. That's the way it flowers. It, yeah, it starts out. It flowers it comes, there, and then yeah. it, the flowers start coming down. coming along. Yeah. Uh, and what's funny is Sherwood, as we had said, it flower or it produces fruit much later than leaf, but they start blooming at the same time, and they'll be in full bloom in June. And the Lee is also setting fruit at that moment. Mm -hmm. But Sherwood, full of flowers and absolutely no fruit. It isn't until about mid-July this starts to set fruit. And I have no idea uh, physiologically why it does that, but that's just the way nature's programmed it. And it makes it wonderful to have a crop after the leaf. I have two, <clears throat> two trees and, uh, in the winter time. All the root come out everywhere, yes. 20, 50 feet. Yes. But fortunately, I, I print on my left, the fence, so they are root. Go to neighbors, get a water. <laughs> <laughs> so I need the watering. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're searching for water. So I suggest people just 
But along the fence line, you need to have a little water. But that's next year's rootstock for me. Oh. And so I dig up a thousand plants or so, put them in five gallon pots, and then starting January 2nd, I start grafting. Oh, I, I see. You know, I had nobody telling me that the wrong time to do it. Wow. So I just start, you know, the first weekend after uh, the new year, and I just graft. And I graft all day long, uh, oh. every day that I'm down there, and so I graft 250 a day. No, I lost her. They love money because I kill them. <laughs> <laughs> you can replant. Uh, um, have you ever experimented letting rootstock grow out to see if it's productive without grafting? You don't, you don't have to let it grow out that year. It will have fruit. They are so precocious, they will have fruit no matter what. The trouble is, it's small, yes. fruit like this, yeah. and it's, it's edible, but it tends to be somewhat sour. Uh, they use it as. Um, a poverty fruit in India. Uh, people will go pick ginger beets because they're so poor they can't afford anything. So that's part of the food they get. Um, it would work fine uh, stuffing turkeys, but they don't tend to do that in India. But, so they eat them sour. And you know, some people like sour things. The Mayu is just a pits. There's hardly any meat. There's hardly any meat, but there's some. And if you don't have any money, that looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's <laughs> is the fruit high in any particular nutrient? Uh, I think I had that in here in the book, but I'm not sure. It is one of the few fruits that has protein. He said something about the right thing. I'm not even sure what I need to look up. Uh, uh, the uh, genus Zyzephus is all over the world. And we have some Zyzephus plants here in the United States. Um, you know, the lilac trees, lilac plants that bloom in uh, April or some of the, the mostly red, bluish ones, but there are some white ones. Those are distantly related to jujubes. Uh, what do we call that? Nutrients. Uh, nutrients. We'll try nutrients. And we'll see. I don't want to have a name of the one. I want to just call it Jujube. Nutritional value. I didn't want to. And where can we buy um, this book if we're interested? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm your local purveyor. Uh, <laughs> How much do you cost? Um, if I mail them, they're $30. Um, can I buy them for you? Buy them for me directly, they're 25 Okay. They cost 20 bucks to get them printed. And that we have to go talk to the printers and really talk them down. So they are available in 275 pages. That's you not bad. Electronic yeah. versions of it? Do you have electronic versions of it? Like an ebook? I don't think there are, but I can check and see. Yeah. In your opinion for a fresh eating fruit, is the GA 186 that you mentioned better than the weed? Uh, GA 866? 866. Um, yes, it's better. But it comes three weeks later, four weeks later. And so if you're really hurting, the, yeah, I gotta have fresh jujube. Well, that's kind of a negative. Um, they're smaller. Oh, this year they were pretty good size. I never seen them so big. So I'm hoping they're gonna get bigger now. How much smaller? Uh, I don't know. Sure, do we have any? Or less sugar cane that I brought? No, I don't have any. No, we didn't bring the 866, so I can't show you anything. Uh, <coughs> 25 to 50 percent smaller in weight. So they are substantially smaller, but A66 is far sweeter. 35% sugar versus 45% sugar. So that's pretty good. And your tongue gets it. It doesn't take long to you know that you're one bite. You can tell. After you dry them, is that when you take the pit out? Or do you take the pit out first before you dry them? No, we leave the pit in and dry them. not to eat them. I mean, then you take the pit out when you eat them. Oh, we have a contest. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's different cu culture. In China, they only eat it dry. They, they, that's due to be a kind of medicine. Yes. You, you can buy from the uh, uh, pharmaceutical mm -hmm. uh, drugstore, like Chinese uh, drugstore. Right. They sell it all year long, all the dry. Yeah, once it's dry, it lasts forever. Right. As long as you don't have mice and rats in your house. Because <laughs> they'll eat it. Yeah. 
So you mentioned there aren't very many pests, so um, you don't have to, nobody has sprays usually? I, I've never, ever sprayed. Okay. I've had no need to. Um, you just keep the gophers away from it and keep the birds away. That's Good. all I ever had to do. So in the market, if it doesn't say organic, it's still... Most likely it is because nothing bothers them. Yeah. You'd be wasting money spraying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do they tolerate salty water? They're one of the few plants that will tolerate salty soil. Uh, and that's, you know, if you're in West Texas where it's extremely alkaline, uh, pH uh, above 8 and salty, it will take both of them as long as it's got water to survive with. They don't care. Are all the trees pretty columnar? Like uh, no. Lee tends to branch out. Sherwood tends to go straight up. So they're completely different cultures. You prune them basically the same way by cutting them. Uh, but they are going to spread. The leaves will spread. What spacing do you plant them? I put them at 15 by 15 because I knew no other number. Does that turn out to be too much? or? Uh, it's a little close. But it's okay. You know, you're packing more trees in yeah. at 15. I think um, most California people put plants at 20 foot interval to 24 foot intervals. So these are a little closer than most of them, but most of them don't spread tremendously like peaches do and, and plants like that. So 15 by 15 is just fine. You'll be able to work with it. Cram more in. What's your email in case we need to order something? Okay, I do have cards here, but it's XOTC fruit. Yeah, XOTC. Fruit at yahoo.com. It looks like exotic fruit. Okay, yeah. Too much, how much variance in flavor between the different varieties? I can't taste it except sweetness. Sweetness I can tell. But I'll, Vietnamese people, especially when they come and they try different varieties, oh, this one's good. I like this one. Oh, that one's okay. And I can't tell them. Why in the world they're tasting different? Fine. But I don't care as long as I got plenty of the one they want. <laughs> okay. Uh, what else do we want to cover? I got. Yeah. Is the candy named after the fruit? Um. They they come from the same derivative uh, because they made medicine out of them, and you know they you would boil down the jujubes to this um, not tasty. Stuff, but this, like jujube fruit are, or jujube uh, candies are, sugary. Gelatin. Yeah, gelatin, yeah. So they come from the same idea. Um, but jujube, jujube candy contains no jujube fruit. <laughs> probably a copy to the. You know, Most of your trees are actually grafted, though, right? They're not All of my trees are grafted. All of them are You've grafted. You've got to have them grafted. Okay. Um, now. A fella in uh, Western Australia, he's learned how to bud them. Uh, but you're taking a, something this big versus taking a six inch stick. I still rather have the six inch stick over the other. I used to handle the wood. The, in the winter, I'd cut it all out, keep it moist, put it in the refrigerator. But after about a month, the fruit didn't last real well, didn't bud out real well. So we just picked to order. And once our season has started, if they start the greening out, I don't sell any more kind of Are there some that are farmers? Yes. Which ones? Sherwood. That's the only one? Uh, there's one called Thornless, but I think it's Lang, L-A-N-G. Uh, that's the drying one. So you can get the Sherwood, which is fresh eating, and it virtually has no thorns, and Lang. Or it's called Thornless. But that may be just a lang. I'm not sure. Lang has a few, but not. Oh yeah, no. Yeah, has some. I mean, it has occasional ones in there. But yeah, yeah. and I guess it one stabs you in the finger. Well, that one ain't thornless. Yeah. Yeah. If you're gonna dry it on the tree, what's the process like? When do you know when to take it off the tree? Uh, you squeeze it, and uh, you'll just know that it doesn't contain much water anymore. When, when, yeah, they get real wrinkled, mm -hmm. and you'll see them here. Are they off? Are you, do you have all the fruit off the tree no, by the time the leaves no. drop? Uh, no. And, and that's a problem I have. I'm trying to dry them, and early rains come. 
And you can pick them off the ground, yeah. too, and they just right. bind that way. But if they're on the ground and they're range a half inch, mm -hmm. they can absorb the water and just screw up the dried fruit. So it's, it's no big deal. Yeah. Do you know where the name's coming from? Who named it Jujube? <coughs> I always wonder because people don't know how to pronounce it. They don't like. I okay. It's technically pronounced jujuba. Okay. And then when I thought about it years and years ago, well, you don't know the fruit anyway. And of course, you're not going to know jujuba. But if you went to the movie theaters in the 1950s and 60s, you know what jujubes are. <laughs> so I just said, well, let's call it jujube. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> And not too many people have corrected me that it has to be this other way. Okay, it's Gigi's. Okay. What drew you to uh, this particular fruit? Uh, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> if, if what, go what on earth possessed you to... to okay, go? first of all, when I was about three years old, my grandmother lived with us. And she would give me potato eyes. And uh, all sorts of grilled tomatoes. So she started me doing different things. And then I just kept getting interested in more and more exotic things. Uh, artichokes, they weren't readily available. So I started growing those. And I got into jujubes back about 1970. I had an aunt that lived in Redding, California. And there was a nursery up there. I went up there because I was trying to find kiwi fruit plants. And this guy had a couple of them. So I bought those two, his bare root time. And asked him, well, do you have anything else? And he scratched his head for a minute and said, well, I've got this tree that just came in. Uh, I don't know anything about it. Uh, that was jujubes. So I, I got a tree because that's all he had, something different. I planted it in my brand new yard. And uh, after about two years or so, started getting fruit on the ground. Didn't know what in the world to do with it. Didn't know who to ask about anything. Uh, my wife put some dried fruit in my lunch sack, because I always ate lunch, the, you know, brought some lunch sack. And I just had them on the table looking at them, wondering if I'm gonna eat them or not. <laughs> and one of my co-workers was from Korea. And he came in and saw those, and I couldn't believe somebody became that excited about seeing some dried red fruit sitting on the table. He just, I haven't seen them since I was in Korea. You know, where did you get them? I just picked them out of my backyard. Uh, oh, can I get some? And his enthusiasm just said that this needs to be done. Uh, it's one of those things that you can, a small backyard person can do, take some exotic fruit that you can only get a few cuttings of or whatever, if nobody else knows about it in the United States, you can make a market with it. And so that was one of them. His excitement got me going on YouTube. Uh, we had done kiwi fruit for years and years, uh, and then the the drought years when we had restrictions. That just ruins kiwi fruit. Um, they have all plants have what they call stoma or stomata on the leaves, and that's the way the tree regulates giving <coughs> off water. Uh, the only trouble with kiwi fruit is they're locked open, <laughs> and, and so they're just going to give off water, give off water. Uh, they're just humidifier plants, so they just cost horribly. And so we got rid of them and just started putting in chichis. Um I didn't know how to graft them. I didn't know how to graft anything. So I went to uh, Sunset Western Garden book, kind of read up on it. It said use um, grafting tape. Well, I didn't know what in the world grafting tape was. But well, scotch tape kind of looks like it. <laughs> so I just got a paring knife and grafting tape, or the, the uh, scotch tape, and put the two together, you know, did a V-shape, and within a month, they took. <laughs> well, this isn't too hard. <laughs> so anybody can do it, you just gotta do it. Do you grow this kind of yes. kiwi? Yes, uh, that's not ginger. This is it now. What is it? That's a wax jambu. Yeah. Oh, you are very good, I just... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, there are jujubes that size. Oh yeah. Yeah, they're called Zyzephus mauritiana, and that's the main Indian jujube. They're much bigger. Uh, they can't take any cold, which is our problem here. 
uh, but they can take temperatures to 125 degrees. And they go dormant in the summertime. So they don't have to spend their water supply in the summer. So they, their fruit comes in, uh, they're the same season as ours, but their fruit will come in March, April. And then the trees go dormant. Exact opposite of what our trees do. Do you have this kind of friend? Yes. Well, actually, I've got both the white one, which is the rare one, and the red one, which is pretty. Where do you yeah. grow? In my home, Tom Dowling. Where? Tom Dowling. Tom Yeah, Orange County. Orange County. Santa Ana. Oh. Yes. It's big like this? Yes. Do you know how much they are selling for like this? One pound? Four ninety five. dollars How much you want them to sell them? Well, I would say four ninety five a pound. That's about right, but I'm selling them $10 a pound. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's a good buy. But they're so neat looking to see this green tree with this red fruit hanging down. It's really neat. It's very pretty. Yeah, yeah very nice. It looks like Christmas time. Unfortunately, it's August when they ripen. But <laughs> Regarding the runners, okay. other than whacking them off or repotting them and things like that, yep. any good way of controlling them and keeping them? Thank you. A lawn mower? Anything else? Any varieties that don't run? Or no, there are no varieties. I tried grafting them onto uh, a closely related plant called uh, Japanese Raisin Tree, Ovinia dulcis. They are related, but apparently a little too far apart for them to, to take very well. Because those don't suffer. But it didn't work. That's a challenge for anybody to try. Some nursery advertising they have, it must be, they've been lying out there. Uh, it could be either way. <laughs> yeah. Are they happy with gray water systems? Oh, sure. As long as it's water. Yeah, that's all they care about. Um, I really don't fertilize them very much. As I said, I threw, yeah. I throw a horse manure on. I've got access to a, a horse place. And so we'll pull the back of the truck up and take it to my place. And then we'll just throw a, a wheelbarrow full on each tree. Uh, and then I do give them some triple 15 fertilizer, but you know, whatever you got, it'll work. Two questions. Um, back to the kiwi, were you growing the fuzzy ones or yes. the hardy kiwi? I grow both now. So does the hardy kiwi take less water? No, unfortunately not. Okay. They get a higher price, which helps. <coughs> Uh, when I first started marketing them, I went through Frida Kaplan up in Los Angeles. I would put them in um, six ounce clamshells and 12 per tray. And we were getting $17 a tray for about four pounds of fruit. That's a good price. And we would go under the tree the, the first weekend in September and just strip pick everything. They, they grow in clusters, kind of like grapes. And you just pull them off. And we just put them in buckets take them up to the patio and then start packaging them same size in, in each container. Uh, but then I got in uh, kind of an argument with her Russian inspector and he didn't like them one time so I just never did it again. Okay, and the second yeah. question is, yeah, is there a market for more growers to grow? I would presume there is. It's untapped. Uh, first of all, the few growers that are doing them and putting them in the Vietnamese markets now, they're all picking them at once. They're pretty tasteless, they're uh, dry, uh, they're just not very nice. So that's why I get two to three times as much money for mine that were picked two hours ago. Uh, you know, Vietnamese people just really love fresh tasting fruit. They hate those nice big ones that look beautiful, but they, they just don't taste to them. So I, I thought I was messed up here three, four years ago. Couldn't sell them anymore because the Koreans had come in. Uh, you know, they have 10 acre plots, especially up in the desert, maybe Moreno Valley, up to the high desert. They all grow up. Uh, but I have no problem selling it to people that know what I've got. And they want that fresh, crispy taste. They don't want too much dried. Uh, the dried fruit is going into farmer's markets. And that's a different clientele. Are you selling trees as well as fruit? That's why I brought them. <laughs> I got about 2,000 trees. What varieties are there? Oh, I brought five. I'm just going to read the varieties. I brought two of each for most of them. Um, if I don't have it that you want, uh, just email me, call me, make arrangements to come up to my place in, in Valley Center.
Honey jar. Oh, let me talk about honey jar for a second. Uh, this is one I got out of Nanjing Botanic Gardens. She sent me five different varieties. I had no idea what they were. Honey jar has a small fruit. You'll taste some of the dried ones here. It is the only fruit that I know of of jujubes that you can eat green and still like it. <laughs> and then they turn red, crispy. They're, they have such a unique taste to them. And the dried ones carry that unique taste. I cannot describe it. You'll get a chance to try them. They're all uh, dried ones, but you'll get to taste them. Uh, Lee, which we've talked about. Sherwood, Chi Hong, another one I got from China directly. Uh, not the best tasting fruits in the world, but it ripens very late. And so it will give you fresh fruit that looks like leaves uh, come at this time of the year. So it's valuable for that reason. Here's a lime. That one's the dried one. It's probably the large, one of the largest ones we have, uh, but it just, is a fresh fruit, it's not that good. Okay, this one is so, S-O. And a neat story behind this one. Uh, it is very contorted. It goes all different directions for the branches. And we found the mother plant was up at the Chico Research Station. But they've bulldozed all that out now. Uh, but we saw it and it had a sign, special wooden sign. It said, let's see, which way do you want? Salt, S-O, China, jujube. Well, did they mean so jujube, or did it just come from South China? <laughs> Nobody knows. But it's kind of, especially when the leaves are all off, the sun casts a shadow on the ground, it's all contorted, going all different directions. It's really neat looking. <coughs> Sugar cane. It got the name because I got the plant from somebody and I put it out in my uh, yard or my farm down here next or near a sugar cane. I had some sugar cane growing and it tasted so sweet. That's how I got some sugar cane. <laughs> Another so, Lee on GA866. What's the treatment on the so? Um, the so is smaller. It's a little bigger than honey jar. Uh, it ripens the very first one is in the uh, first of summer. Uh, it's okay, but because it's so small, there are better ones. Unless you just got to have it in you know, the very first of the season, uh, then it's valuable for that. It's more, I like it more just because of the shadow that it casts on the ground in the summer, in the winter time. <laughs> okay, uh, there's a few other fruit that I've got here. Oh, uh, let's see what. Oh, chewy mint. This one. It, it probably came out of China. Uh, the, the Chinese speakers that I've talked to have no idea what shui men means, what it would translate to. Uh, it's a long, elongated fruit, but it's nice eating. Uh, especially, the, it comes about three weeks after Lee does. Elongated fruit, nice crispy. Uh, it is the most date-like of all the jujubes that I know of. Uh, it's chewy. When it starts to dry, the chewiness just comes out like it being a date. Uh, yeah, here's Chi Hong. Now the Lang's. Oh, yeah. oh, this is Silver Hill. This is the one I said, ah, it's okay for you. Uh, but it's one of the last ones of the year. So, you know, it's elongated fruit. It, you can taste it, it's just not that. Great. This is sugar cane. Oh, I got the um, the globe. I don't know what happened to it. It's here. Oh, okay. Is that the globe? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the larger ones. It's called globe. Got it from China. Uh, it gives me one of the biggest fruits of all the jujubes I've seen. Uh, the problem is it's a drying jujube. So when you eat it fresh, it's kind of mealy. Uh, just not as nice as, as the other ones. Uh, but it's large fruited, and so if you let it dry, you can take some of the dried ones too. Uh, this is half and half, it's dried on one side, and 
fresh onion was set. So you get <laughs> both things. Right? Yes. Does it make any difference if you dry it on a tree or in the, on the counter? Not that I know of. So, I used to pick it off a tree. A friend of mine in New Mexico that bought a lot of trees for me, he grows them and he dries the fruit in a hothouse with a, a ceiling that is open, has a sun that can get through, and he dries them there. And then he sells them at a farmer's market in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hmm. So he's very happy doing that. What's their nutritional value? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. I'm not sure if we looked it up. Yeah, I went five different directions at once. <laughs> Nutritious, 155. Mm. But I don't think it said much. Well, was, <laughs> there was a site on the internet, I'm not sure where it was, but uh, they did give quite a bit of nutrition. Right, right. Really? Yeah. Um, you know, it says the dried GGP fruits are good for the heart, liver, spleen, lungs, and kidneys. <laughs> Recurring coughs, prolonged life. <laughs> uh, I didn't edit any of the things that I published in here. Some of it is contradictory. <laughs> the sugar content of the dried fruit is 50% to 90%. That's darn sweet. Protein content is 1.2 to 3.3%. Contains 18 amino acids, 18 of the 24 that are essential for human life. So, fairly nutritious. In China, they believe if you eat this one, you can get a pregnancy. If the women don't have a baby, uh -huh. and cook with a ginseng, chuchubi, and all chicken hands. Hands? What about yeah. five years old hands? But really old hands. Uh -huh. <laughs> they can get a baby. They can do that, I don't know. <laughs> so, there is some in information here. They wouldn't let me publish everything that I had, unfortunately. Yeah. Are you saying that if we try to plant those dried seeds that will get no results? Yeah, you're going to be sitting around a long time watching this. You have to get seed that is viable. And I have no idea why these seeds are not viable. If you crack them open, you will see the little kernel, which is the actual seed part. And if there's anything in there, it's all dried up. So it will not be viable. Mm -hmm. Yeah? What does the literature say about the way to go about sprouting them? Uh, it really says nothing that I've ever read. That's why you, I sell the, the seeds that are viable. But really, I've never heard back from anybody who said, yeah, I got 30 plants out of this. <laughs> I just know that the seed is viable, uh, but I've never followed up on anything. Nobody's mm -hmm. written me back. Of course, nobody's asked for their $5 back either, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the price difference between selling fresh and selling dry? Um, I charge a buck and a half for either one. Oh. Number one, number one, I want to sell the dried fruit. Yeah. Because it all falls on the ground anyway, <laughs> so that loses lots of money. Uh, and I would like to start that market up. And I really just don't know what to try to do for dried fruit. It should get more money because it weighs half the amount. Uh, but you know, you, you got to start someplace. You should start, start selling recipes. You know, Chinese recipes. Uh, I've got recipe. a few, and there, there's another type of. Yeah. These are called hongzhao right. okay. when they're dry. Mm -hmm. There's also a ginger bee that's dried is called haze out, yes. which is smoky. Right. And I've got the recipe for that if anybody wants to smoke their ginger bees. <laughs> we, use, we use the hong zhao for dessert. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Dessert dishes, so. well, yeah, when they're 75, 80% sugar, <laughs> yeah. that's pretty nice. Yeah, with sweet rice. Yeah. Do you have any plants or trees that do well at companion plants and ginger bees? Do what? Do you have any companion plants that do well interplanted with ginger bees? Uh, weeds do wonderful. <laughs> Beyond that, you know, uh, what I used to do, and I don't do it anymore, I used to rototill up the rows and then plant horned melons in between them. Uh, then the squirrels got wise to me and they started eating my little plants. Then I got wise to them and started putting chicken wire around them. So hey, we're, we're fighting each other. Uh, but I used to plant corn melons because those got us good money. 
Those would get us, in the very beginning when I started, we would get $34 okay. for a 9 to 12 tray fruit. Are they the same as the fragrant melon? We call <coughs> no, bitter melon or? Xianghua. Fragrant melon. The golden color? Yeah, that little yellow. Yellow, golden? Yeah, no, they're completely different. More melons are cucumbers from Africa. Oh, okay. H O N G? Uh, Horn. Horn, H O R N E D. Orange okay. melons. Kiwano is a mm -hmm. trademarked name from New Zealand. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they're okay to eat. If you get them real cold, you scoop out everything in the center and you eat that. And it's refreshing. Put some ice cream in it and something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you to make them better. But, you know, when you're getting $32 or $34 a tray, that's great money. We had to polish them up a little bit, get the dirt off of them, put them in the box, and take them down. Now we're getting about $13 a tray. So, I mean, it's still good money. Uh, they're also been called jelly melons. Uh, a few other names, too, and other people that don't like them give them really good names. Yeah. <laughs> Any more? I don't know where else to go. Are we done? So, uh, we'll have these fruit out for everybody to try, uh, and we'll try to replenish when you've eaten them all. Uh, there's a few of them. I've only got enough, maybe for one person, one fruit each person. But other fruit, I got a lot of, so you can uh, fill up on you. So I think that's it.